You're listening to Fishing the DMV with your hosts, Thomas Ahrens and Jared Mounts. Fishing the DMV is brought to you by Jake's Bait and Tackle, located in Winchester, Virginia. If that doesn't get you jacked up, I don't know what will. He called his shot, made an adjustment, and it was absolutely awesome and skittles for everybody. And the other guy, you might know him for his channel, but let's just get these here now. Yeah, I know you need shirts to say taste the rainbow or something. I know, dude. We're working on it. We might have to come up with something. We got, we got Hunter Smith, guys, and we got Matt of SB Fishing. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for having us on. No, th- thank you guys for making this happen. Um, you know, you are Hunter, you're always welcome on here anytime. And then Matt, I mean, this is something that's been in the works. I've definitely wanted to get you on the show. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for both of you guys this evening. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. We got some, we got a uh, Kerr coming up here. It's insane. The amount of tournaments. I mean, you guys have as well. I mean, we have a BFL on, on the Potomac coming up. We have the bass open at Kerr and then we have Kerr. I think it's the weekend after is your BFL back on Kerr. That poor lake gets absolutely just smoked. It's insane. And I think they have, I think they have one or two tournaments the weekend after the final day of the open too. Yeah. Going into it with Kerr, like, I really wanted to start with just a, a vague understanding of the lake for people up here in Northern Virginia and Maryland don't really understand it. Uh, Kerr is the biggest lake, I believe, in the Roanoke system of lakes. Is that correct? Yeah, I think um, I think it might be the biggest lake in like Virginia, probably. It's you might be right. The place I'm is not, massive, I'm not one hundred percent, but it. I mean, it's got to be as big. It's got to be bigger than Smith Mountain. Yeah, one hundred percent huge yeah the place is massive so it's i mean i don't know the exact specs on it but that's just and and the main lake isn't super big like it's long but it's the creeks like you'll go into a creek and it'll go back i don't know 10 to 20 (laughs) miles like it's it's unreal so you can it's a definitely probably one of the hardest lakes to practice on there's a lot of just do nothing bank like clay banks and you're like oh there can't be a fish over there then you idle over and there's a school of 30 like it's it's a very difficult lake to figure out, but once you get on them, it's a really good pattern lake. What what makes that place so difficult right now? Is it just the fluctuation of the water being a being that as primary uh, reason for existing? I think so. I think that your normal water level is, I believe, at like three hundred, and I mean, yeah. you mix in spawning fish and and fluctuating water, it's going to make it just the fish could be anywhere from you know, in inches of water up to 20, 25 foot. So it, that's, I think what is going to make it very difficult. What now, now that we're getting into May, what are those fish generally doing right now? Um, it's the same thing. You'll have some fish that are right in the middle of the spawn and you'll have some fish that are done spawning and you might still have some fish that are pre-spawn that haven't moved up yet. In Virginia, I know, especially on the river, we catch spawning fish from April to June. So there, there's a, these fish spawn a lot longer than people think. So you're going to have fish in all three phases. What are the water temperatures right now that you're seeing? I'm seeing, I think when Matt and I went out 62, 61, 62 around there, I think yep. you're going to see, I think there's some arms where it could be, you could see some water even in the 59s and then all the way up to probably 55 or 65 up to maybe 68 right now. So it's a, because the lake's so big, it could be just different in every creek you go into. Uh, what's absolutely interesting to me about that is it's an absolutely massive lake, but the weights, it, it's 17 pounds, 18 pounds. You know, I have I have BFL stats up right here, and I was trying to go back, and it, it's hard to find times when everyone's in the top five have like 20 pounds. I mean, this is not a place that you're going to go up there, and it's going to be a, a quote-unquote slugfest. I don't think the size of the lake really has – too much to do with that to be honest because well all right first of all we can go with fishing pressure because that place sees three tournaments every saturday and sunday from march until october and i think that that just makes big fish extremely difficult to catch um i don't know like i'm trying to think of another like what's another lake that's really big that is just like you go smash them i guess smith mountain yeah but I that is so, a different fishery so overall. Different. Yeah. Like it, and that's what's confusing to me. 
um, is the fact that, uh, Matt, you fish, you fish Chesden once or twice, right? And so that's a smaller lake near Richmond and it still can produce some donkeys. And if you had to pick which one would probably have, would have a better bag, if it was a hundred boat tournament, I would assume probably Chesden, you have a better chance of cracking a 20 pound bag. So, you know, that's a smaller lake, but still it produces absolutely insane weight. And that thing you've never heard of, but then Chesden and I, I I'm sorry, Chesden Kerr. And maybe it's because of the size people. We have so many BFLs there, so many cat tournaments. Now Bass Opens, all these tournaments go there. It's almost like the Beaver Lake for tournament fishing in our area. People go there, but it, it's not the place that I really would want to go on the schedule. And I, I'm confused as to like why it it underperforms like it does. It doesn't make any sense. It's a tough nut to crack. It really is. I've it has whooped me so many times. I've just the last ABA I fished, I finally made some money, and it was it. You could have told me I won the Bassmaster Classic. It was like <laughs> that. I don't know if I think it is like we keep saying the size is very difficult. I mean, you could you're only like for me, my only fish were 10 miles apart from each other. I had two areas. So it's like you're running for, you know, half your day just going back and forth to your spot. So it's it makes it a tough tournament. Like, But also with all these tournaments, the fish get shuffled around so much like you'll have a like this week we have a. Bassmaster Open's going out of Okanichi. Yep. Okanichi. And then the BFL is going out of Nutbush. So they're going to bring all the fish up to Okanichi. And then we're going to go to Nutbush. We're going to bring all the fish back down. So it's just, you have all these tournaments and it's just throwing fish all over the lake that it makes it very, very interesting. How much do you think the blueback will play and a lot of this pelagic fish moving around? I think it'll start coming more into play the further uh, into spring we get. You know, the warmer the water gets, the more fish that spawn and move back offshore and start chasing bait around. I mean, I can tell you, I scoped a couple this weekend on the res, and they're probably slightly behind Kerr. You know, it's, what is it, 200 miles difference? Um, yeah, there's already fish kind of on those big bait balls that you can chase around. I definitely think Kerr is further ahead of the res in that sense. So I have a feeling that if you can go out and look around and find that you might do pretty well for yourself. I also wonder how much and, and guys, so if you don't know about the res, you know, or the res about Kerr, it does fluctuate a lot. It's usually, you know, just like we said, it's about a 300 level. It's up there. I think it's at 304, 302. I could, don't quote me on that. You can let me know in the comment section if I'm wrong. And so that puts it up in the bushes. And so the bushes are usually going to be in play there. The only issue I have with that is, is that going to be consistent? Is that going to be actually the consistent bite? Um, I, with the water fluctuating so much, I, I don't know what is going to happen when if you're going to try to be looking for spawners or that pre-spawn bite. Are you going to actually go up in the bushes and try to risk that? Or knowing that that may or may not last four days or three days, are you going to be looking just for those fish that are in that in-between area? What do you guys think? So... For example, on the first day of opens practice, the water level was at, I believe, 301. And right now it's at 303.5. And that was last Friday. Today's what, Monday? So that's three days the lake has risen two feet. So, like, that is already going to make it insane. So if it's me, I think the way I think, and it's coming from a tidal fishery mindset, when we have a flood tide, I think that those fish go explore places that they can't usually fish like or go like these fish may there's places that they may have never been. So I think when that water goes up they're they're going to go try and find something new, something they haven't seen. And then so I'd be looking at the bank first off. I know Matt Matt's probably going to be scoping it either way, but that, that that would be me. I'd probably go to the bank and see see what moves up. Yeah, I think there's going to be a huge portion of anglers because any when even when I was a kid fishing high school tournaments, all the all the old timers talking about the bushes that occur, and that's where you get lasered in. So I don't if you're not a local, I think you're going to be allured to go to the bushes and try to find those fish. But I I wonder how spread out that's going to make them, and if that's going to be consistent. I think you can catch them, but I think scoping and looking for the hard structure or those those fish that are chasing bait i think that's going to be the consistent plan there a hundred percent and that's interesting you talked about nutbush because there are so many creeks in this in the area of virginia that you could literally fish that I, the chick on the james nutbush mata woman 
I mean, those three places, that's all you need to fish. And you could probably cash checks. It's insane how we have on these three fisheries, such unique areas that all the fish get dumped in or taken out of when it comes to the chick, I guess they get taken out of the chick. Um, how does that deal with the pressure when you fish a tournament, knowing that there are areas that are just, there's going to be about 500 boats, but there is a winning population. How does that factor into your decision-making? So for me, I, the way that these two tournaments are setting up with the open and the BFL, I like fishing up, up the lake. That's where I feel more comfortable. Um, that's where I've, you know, caught fish in the past. So these people bring in all the fish back to o Okanichi, which is up the lake. It sets up a lot better for my, I'm practicing. I'll probably only be up the lake. I probably won't spend any time in Nutbush, any time, you know, Eastland, those creeks. I'm going to stay up river because I feel like up river because I feel like they're going to dump the, they're not going to take that, you know, release boat that far. They're not run that thing all over the lake. So they're going to dump it close to Okanichi. So I think those fish aren't going to go far, especially in the spawn. They're probably going to look for the best bank they can find that's closest to them. So that's how I'm going to practice. I don't know what your plan is. I mean, that makes the most sense. If you think yeah. about it, you have a, uh, what, 225 boat open out of the state Good park. God. <laughs> three days. Okay. So two days, there's 225 boats, right? Yeah. Top 10 fish the last okay, day. I think. So that's however many, 2,500 fish if everyone a catches fish. a limit, yeah. I guess, something around there. And they bring those back every day. And like you said, they're not taking that release boat anywhere. Probably drive out like a yeah. quarter mile and just dump all the fish. So. There's going to be a lot of fish there. That's a, never a bad plan. You know, how many times have you heard about going and catching retreads? Like, yep. go to where what? the uh, launches are. But, but Matt, fish. why is that? Why does me, that have I hate, I hate it. Like, oh, finish your thought. Finish your thought. Sorry. 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 I was saying, oh, I, I, I just don't. The thought of catching already caught fish to me, I don't know why. It just bugs me. Like, I'll, I'll do it, but. You're targeting the smart. Uh, you're targeting like, the smartest fish in the lake because they they're so they so fresh. Caught. Like yeah. they got caught a week ago. Yeah. Like they know what they know what a bait. They know what they got caught on, and they're probably not going to eat it. Okay. This is. I'm glad, Matt. I'm so glad you said this. Uh, so I've heard people talk about this before about retreads. I don't want to fish retreads, and I I want genuinely your opinion on this because. You look at some of these Japanese anglers that have two lakes in their whole damn country and they'll just yep. drive off the boat ramp and they, they, they win and it's, you can do it. But over here in America, there's this weird connotation. It's like, Oh, you fish in Mata woman. It's like, that doesn't count as, as, as being successful. They're, you know, they get dumped there all the time. I, talk to me about that. Your mindset with that. I don't know. Maybe it's the whole entire thing. Like, you know, fishing out of a boat, right? You take your boat to the boat ramp and you drive off and leave the boat ramp to find fish. Um, mm. I mean, it's probably more counterproductive than it is productive the majority of the time, but I think that's quite possibly uh, something that's been like, you know, drilled into my head subconsciously since I started fishing. It's like, why would I sit here at the boat ramp even though it probably has the most fish uh, when I have this boat. But yeah, I don't, I don't know. I think there's definitely something about going into an area that's like a huge community hole and fishing. One, if there's a ton of boats around, I immediately am already like, I don't just, I don't want to fish around a ton of people. Um, but again, in, in these situations, sometimes you have to, right? Yeah. Like there's, you, unless you can find something that you is like so off the wall and different where there's not, ton of other boats but when you have 600 boats out from three different tournaments on a saturday that you're competing in sometimes it's hard to get away so a perfect yeah. example of that was this past weekend we had um i fished a tournament on the chickahominy and we had the college series um going out of osborne they had 275 <laughs> boats college series Dear and we God. had probably five or six more tournaments on the chick and probably one out of hope so and the fish are spawning and everyone knows on the chick when the fish are spawning they're spawning they're on trees because that's i mean that's the hard cover so that's that's how you win that's how you win this time of year is you flip trees so you had probably 250 boats in the chick alone all fishing trees so that's to prove that point that sometimes it's just part of what you have to do i also think it's mindset too of growing up 
my home water being the, sadly the tidal Potomac, you learn how to fish in bumper to bumper traffic for better or worse. And I, I had a great conversation with Chris Gorsuch guys, Susquehanna guide service about boat ethics. And if you had to teach a high school course about how to be respectful and we really, in that conversation got to the point, like it really depends on the body of water because what you would do on the reservoir, the res or which is Occoquan guys, if you didn't know, uh, or Kerr, you probably couldn't do in April on the Potomac river. Like, and, and that's so hard. And I really does think it gets down to your mindset of being able to fish with people around you and dealing with it. And also, I think this is why guys that grow up fishing tidal bodies of water kick ass in Florida. They know if they have to fish a grass flat with 500 other boats, they're like, yeah, this, I can make this work. But yeah, you know, that, that's so fascinating to me, get, getting that information. Guys, let me know in chat right now. Do you fish? Are you okay with fishing in crowds if you cash check? Or are you just going to eat it, burn $200 worth of gas and just get away from everybody? Let me know in chat right now why, if, if you're good with yeah. it, uh, and if you're not. How did you two meet? Um, That's actually a really funny story. So I was, I'll admit, I was a fan. Um, and I saw Matt, the fishing, the Richmond fishing. Richmond Expo. Yeah, Richmond Expo. I saw Matt, and I just went up and, you know, shook his hand, introduced myself. And I think we kind of just chatted up, texting you know, Instagram. And then we finally got out probably 2021, somewhere in there. Yeah. When I moved down here. Yeah. And we, oh yeah, he moved down to Richmond yeah. and pretty much just been fishing together ever since. And you guys are now, are you guys uh, touring buddies for, if I'm not mistaken, is it the Piedmont division of the BFLs? Correct? Yep. Yeah. We yep. travel together for those. How, and I think this is really important for people that maybe want to take a crack at the BFLs. How does that work when you have multiple guys, let's say, metaphorically you're sharing a house um how do you break down a lake as a team to do it efficiently before a tournament and j just j generic stuff so i think that i think we did pretty good at smith mountain we kind of yeah. we kind of left each other a, like we went and did whatever we felt like was right during the day like i would go fish my stuff matt would go fish his stuff and a lot of time we'd end up there was a couple of times we ended up in the same creek like just out of mm -hmm. pure coincidence. And so obviously, I mean, we're sharing a house together. We're going to talk about how our day went. So we would talk. And if there was something that, you know, I felt would be valuable to him, I'd tell him if he would tell me. And um, I think it's important to kind of not, we didn't step on each other's toes at all. Like if he had a creek that he really liked, I told him, I was like, you won't see me in there. Like, that's all you like, go smash him in there. And I think, you know, he would do this same thing to me. So for yeah. sure. I, like I think as far as like information and sharing and stuff like we both fished our own ways throughout practice but it was like you know we'd share water temps that we'd see uh water color what baits were working what baits were not working what we were catching them on you know things that we things that I would find or see that I think would be helpful for someone or, you know hunter that's what I would share with them I think that's like a pretty big thing too like if you're going off of if he's telling me like oh i'm catching him on jerk baits on these shallow rocky points like if i just solely go do that i'm not going to be able to grow from that and like put a secondary plan together and bouncing these things off of each other throughout the few practice days up to the tournament i think makes like a huge difference and it's important um not to like fully go off of what each other are doing and it's giving enough information that you can help but not getting so dialed in and this is at my 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 view on it if you're too dialed into somebody else's fish you, it's not going to work you can't fish other people's fish it's so freaking hard and you know, talking to guys like in the florida side of things it's so important though to get people to travel with to help you break down if you're going down to the harris chain there is no way in hell one person can break down on those lakes you need to have that community set up and, and learning how to take information and give information to the trusted friend group is it's so freaking important, I think, in this day and age to have success. I mean, look what they're doing in the Bass Opens. I mean, you you know their information sharing. And there's nothing wrong with that, the stigma. It's just how you share information that's important. I mean, even in the elites, I saw a post today from Carl Jockinson where he was saying, he was like, Gussie. Gussie, looking yeah. him up with this. Yeah. Yep. Because he'd helped him like a couple of years ago, I guess, when they were there. And, you know, I'm sure there's guys like that in basically every series that has any sort of fishing tournament, you know, you travel with buddies or you make friends when you're out there and help each other out. 
in that sense. I think that that's one of the biggest, like, that's why we all fish. Like, we love just chopping it up with our buddies. Like, oh, I caught him doing this. How'd you catch him? You know, so I think that's just part of the fun. Like, I'm, me and Matt, we're both not big information guys. Like, going up to a tournament, we don't talk to anyone. We're not texting people, hey, what are they eating here? Like, I have people reach out to me. They're like, oh, I heard you're going to bugs. Like, I'll tell you, you know, what you should do. I'm like, I'd rather figure it out by myself. That's just how him and I roll. So when we get down there, it's pretty much with a open mind and we just go from there and see what we can figure out. How, how does your styles, do they complement or are they completely different? I'm assuming we're not dealing with just completely offshore and John Cox, like just completely oil and vinegar here. Did your styles both complement each other or it's completely different? So you're not fishing each other's fish, so to speak. That's an interesting one. It is. I Because I definitely would say over the last two years, I've gotten way more comfortable fishing offshore, obviously, with live scope. But Hunter fishing the river is just a beast shallow. Like, it's almost perfect practice. Yeah. Because I know <laughs> the things that I would be like, okay, I'm going to be looking deeper on points, secondary points, channel swings, stuff like that. Like, any sort of cover that I can find. I love fishing brush piles and stuff and like that mid range. And I don't, yeah, that's like what I would focus on. Cause I think that's what will like win you one. Yeah. Like it'll, you'll be able to catch five big ones doing that. But then if you get on, if you miss that shallow bite, yep. like if, I, if it's not happening, which a lot of the times it's not, it, you got to stumble on it just right. But like the shallow bite, you get on that and you can really yep. put something big together. Matt, Matt's very, Matt fishes a lot of stuff that I would never even think to fish. <laughs> like I remember last year we were fishing, we were practicing for the James river BFL and I'm going down the lake <laughs> And I see these two, how tall are they? 300 foot, 500 foot tall? They're tall. Giant power lines that are going into the water. And they have huge pilings. And I see a boat. And I'm like, I'm probably two miles away. And I see a boat. And I'm like, the only person I know dumb enough to stop and go fish those pilings is Matt. Sure enough, it's him. And he's <laughs> and I pull up and he's catching fish off these pilings. And I'm like, I would never in a million years be driving by those power lines and think, Oh, let me throw a cast over there. There were so many fish in those power and lines too. It was sick. It's it's stuff like that that'll definitely benefit us both. Like I'm sure there's banks that I stop on that Matt's like, I would never stop on that bank. For sure. And then so that that definitely helps us, you know, rolling together. How did you know about was it something specific about the power lines that clued you into that? Yeah, please tell us. It's, okay, all right. Well, it's, <laughs> it's summertime, right? We're out on the river. I have this deep thought since I started. <laughs> the potomac river that in the summertime you always see the weights go down and no one can catch big ones and it's like where do those fish go they go offshore somewhere there are there are fish offshore in tidal rivers that no one targets or they're very quiet about it we'll say that so it's something that uh i've started to try messing around with and i saw those and i was like i have no idea how deep they are but i'm just gonna go graph around them real quick and look and one of them is like not on a flat, but it's a little bit shallower. It's like eight to 10 feet. And it was loaded with fish. There was a ton of bait. I caught a couple striper. I caught a couple like two to three pounders. I caught one like right when you rolled up. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't know. I think things like that, that people will not stop and fish or look at, they're like, no, that's dumb. It's in the middle. Of the, like it's in the middle of the river. Uh, I don't know. Could be something hot that could win you a, win you a tournament one day. But it, it's so interesting, though, that we get into these mindsets as anglers. Um, so, I mean, you think the Potomac River, everyone I've talked, everyone that's outside the, our area that asks about the Potomac River, they just think strictly chatterbait. But mm -hmm. then you think about how many tournaments are one on a drop shot or a shaky head in finesse. M majority of them in the summer. Yeah, I exactly. It's finesse fishing. And it doesn't. And it's just thinking outside the box of like, well, even though this is, you know, a power fishing, just absolutely dream, you got to think outside the box. You looking at the place more like a lake, I would assume. And like, okay, why wouldn't they be here? Why wouldn't this work? I've destroyed them on the Potomac on a spy bait on a highly pressured submerged flat. It's like, why wouldn't it works, you know, for small mouth and it works for other places. Why wouldn't it work here? And, but we get in our minds like it, no, it can't because it's, this is just how it is. 
And again, I challenge people that are listening, like just think outside the box. You, you don't want to really put yourself into these like little uh, forms that it, this is how it has to be, whether it's with spinning tackle, whatever baits you're throwing. If you're the first one to do it, you'll be rewarded for it 100%. Um, what, what do we got here in the comment section? Don't blow up Pohick spot. I, it's a damn creek. I'm not blowing up a damn creek. I'm just saying I caught him in Pohick. Good Lord. <clears throat> oh. And I just did blow up the spy bait. I don't care. You still got to figure it out, but there's some <laughs> tips for you. Um, but yeah, God, you guys are just crazy. I love you guys, but you guys are absolutely crazy. Anyway, um, one thing about the live scope and not to go into this completely, uh, Matt, I'd love to have you back on again so we could do a, a, a proper biopic uh, on, on your journey. What is fascinating to me is how everybody assumes, and I don't know how much you've gotten this in your comment section, probably a lot, that clearly that means you're sniping every damn fish that you see. And that's how you're winning every tournament. To me with live scope, the, there's so many side benefits to do it with scope that people don't talk about, whether it's just seeing if there's bait. I knew in the area I found in Pohick, there was a ton of just small bait balls. I think they were, I thought they were snakehead fry. Without live scope, I wouldn't know that. I wouldn't have switched to a small crankbait and absolutely killed them that i would did not snipe a single fish but that right there told me that there was bait in the area i needed to stay put and grind it out you never hear that enough but it's always if you have scope on your boat clearly all you're doing is you're sight fishing all day like why are people so narrow-minded with it because they haven't used it there you go <laughs> the people that just talk shit about it and are like that's you know that's why you're winning all the tournaments that's why you're doing so good yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely a portion of it, but it's also extremely hard. And like, you might only go out and get five or six bites a day, but it's the right five or six bites. Um, if I catch one of like the hundred fish that I see, I'm like, that was a good day. And mm -hmm. that was pretty good. I cast it so, so, so many that just chase it or like, you know, are lazy or just want to look at it or get spooked off by it completely that. You know, getting one to actually react in a positive manner. It's like, all right, let's do it. Did making the move outside of, of Rich to Richmond, did that really help you with your live scope game? Being able to have different lakes to play around with and not just, you know, having the title Potomac and the res in your backyard. Um, I didn't have it when I was living up there, so it's hard to say, but I definitely have learned quite a bit at the res like that. The Aquaquan Reservoir is somewhere i would say that i know the best like i'm most comfortable fishing there just because i have the most uh, of my time out there so being able to add the live scope to that and the way the place sets up uh it's i learned quite a bit but being down this way you know chesden spend a lot of time on chesden just because i know there's big fish in there um and scoping a lot out there um uh, but I don't know. Besides that, I guess it's like I'm on the chick and the James a little bit here and there. It's harder to, I don't scope as much when I'm there. I don't know. I scope more when I'm there. Do you, oh, well, I, yeah. Cause that, that's something that I've figured out on the chick and I, I don't turn my live scope off at all. Like even if I'm going to chick Lake and it's two foot deep, I have the live scope on. And I have found so many brush piles. I have that found so many pods of bait fish. Obviously, you're not going to bass aren't going to show up great in two or three foot of water. But so many times I have found things that help me catch fish using live scope in three to even, you know, one foot of water. And I think it's something that a lot of people aren't utilizing on those types of lakes and reservoirs. But there that that tool and it is a, it's just a tool. It has so many more uses than it's getting used for. Oh, a hundred percent. And it's absolutely crazy that people don't think outside the box more. And I think that's such a weird issue with bass fishing where you're taught at a young age, not to think outside the box. And especially with the old school anglers. And I think that's what you're seeing with a lot of these new school anglers that are able to dive into the information gathering and being able to then experiment and gamble and that's why you're seeing this huge explosion in, in young anglers i mean look at millican example I, I know he's not a young stud but you know he's taking all this stuff bringing it together and then he's able to think outside the box which is absolutely it's, it's just fascinating to watch um and, and bring it back to to kerr reservoir here and looking through the chat here and don't worry guys i'll get to your questions at, at the end i just want to make sure we we have these really cool anglers here i want to make sure we use their time wisely w with kerr 
and then you've got the BFL and then you're going back. How does that affect you mentally with your tournament coming up? You know this place is going to get pounded. Are, are you going into it already thinking that you're going to make these like adjustments? You don't have to tell me the adjustments now, but like, is it affecting your strategy at all? Knowing this place oh, is going to get beat up. 100%. And I'm the way I'm going into it is I'm I'm thinking. I mean, the thing with the opens guys, and I say it, I truly believe it's the toughest tournament trail in the world. Um, they find everything. There is nothing on Kerr that is gonna be that there's no stone that will be left un, unturned. So there's no think there's not even really any thinking outside the box going into this tournament. Like that's how you would think you have to go into it, but no matter what you do, they have done it and they have done it probably 40,000 times in the span of eight days. So I don't even know. I'm just going to go fishing. Like that's, I think that lake sees so much pressure. Those fish are just used to it. Like truly, I think that like, yeah, you're fishing a pressured fishery, but it's not like it just like something just opened up and there's like a ton of tournaments there. Those fish are literally born and raised and like grow to whatever point they grow to experiencing 500 boats every Saturday, Sunday, 10 months out of the year and being fished for. Yeah. I, I I'm, I'm interested, you know, and, and hopefully guys, I, I have a call into the Virginia department of wildlife resources. I'm trying to get a DWR guy that runs that like to come on and talk about the bait fish populations. Cause I keep hearing Ignazium on forums and stuff that I've been going through this week about the blue back there. I don't think the blue back are there yet as heavy as they are in other lakes. I think in five to 10 years it'll play. And then you have the spotted bass and, and the bass podcast was talking about the spotted bass a little bit there. I don't think the spots are going to play as hard as like a Gaston necessarily. And, and again, um, but I, we, this could be a whole nother show is about the whole Gaston thing, but like the spots on Gaston night and day different than Kerr. I do not think that's going to be a hard play, but I, I could be wrong about that. I don't, I don't think you'll see. I think you'll I obviously see spotted bass weighed in, but they're going to be like accidental catches. It's not going to be no one. I don't think anyone's going to be targeting spotted bass as a way to, you know, cash a check or win. Like you're not winning with spotted bass there. And I'm going through the comment section. Oh, we got so many comments. Uh, is it? Yo, Tom, did what the dude learn how to spell? Yo, Tom, did you have a rubber band on your neck? Oh, how the hell did you pick that up so fast? Yeah, I did. Um, I've been again. I'm not talking about this yet because I don't know if it works. I've been throwing a rubber band on here because every time you skip the damn thing, it explodes. So I've been experimenting with just putting a rubber band on it, and that way I have all three hook points exposed. And Genius. I I'm literally today, I've been racking my brain all day of like, <laughs> I need to buy a magnet, an extra magnet. I can go <laughs> into this mag draft, like, or thinking about what else I can do to keep that treble hook pinned up in the belly. The rubber band crossed my mind like 10 times. I was like, nah, it's not going to work. Ah, maybe it will work. So, I think, I it will. Before, let yeah, yeah. Let, let me try first, but because before you do that and it screws you in a tournament because it doesn't work, let, let me actually hook a few more with it. Um, cause yeah, like I, I try to do a, a four prong hook, but the problem is I think that when, the more prongs of the hook you put in there, the less, uh, hook force you have per point. And I just don't know if yeah. adding another point and then really gummy it in there. Cause mm -hmm. I've gone through a couple of mag drafts already. Cause you keep shoving it back in and it just completely destroys it. Oh yeah. I, I've probably gone through 50 mag drafts. Good God, I, <laughs> it's that's probably my favorite bait. Like so that's about six grand right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> but um, for, to me, like, I, in my opinion, like once that magnet's gone, it's hard to make that bait do what you need it to do. So I, that's why I go through them so fast is once I lose the magnet, I'm like, well, this, cause I mean, like you said, you can only tuck the bait up in the belly so many times before it's going to start ripping and, if you, and I skip, that's when I throw mag draft the most is skipping docks, skipping, you know, stuff like that. So that, that hook is not going to stay in the belly. It's going to come out every single skip, unless you have that mag draft, which is going to, you know, catch that hook when you start swimming it. But I go through a lot of mag drafts because of that. I'm wondering how well that's actually going to play the swim bait bite on Kerr. I mean, I really, in my gut says it's, it's not like a, it's not a Smith mountain lake kind of deal. I just don't see it going to being like, like there. 
Do you guys think the swim bait's going to play at all? It might. I mean, I'll definitely throw it around a little bit. I think the, I think a big thing with that mag draft bite is that clear water. Mm -hmm. I really do. I think it draws fish from like way further away than you think. I mean, I've seen it on the scope, like watching it come back under a dock and like see a fish from 20 feet away, see it at like the last second and he like shoots up to it and smokes it. I was on Norman last weekend and I had like a really fun two days, three days of throwing mag drafts, like probably caught 15 on it the first day. And they were small spots, like nothing even big, biggest, maybe three pounds, but they were going nuts over it. It was insane. Didn't you also, you had a fun time with, uh, was it cruise? That was like a couple weeks ago, probably too, but I don't, the days blur together. Yeah, that was probably in early March. It was early March because I was at, or I fished Smith Mountain Lake. Um, It was like an English choice event. And then the next day I met up with Cruz and we fished a small lake. That was a lot of fun. He's a really good dude. It was the first time meeting him and hopped on my boat. Honestly, I haven't told anybody this, but the it was funny because the way it was set up, like we texted back and forth a little bit, but it was really set up through my friends over at English Choice. And I was under the assumption that he was going to bring his boat. And mine was like a complete mess from the tournament the day before. Um like not ready. I didn't even charge my batteries because I stayed at a friend's house and like I showed up to the lake and I'm just waiting for him and like a truck pulls up and I was like, oh my God, I got to clean the boat. <laughs> like, this is, it, yeah, I felt terrible. I was like, yeah, hopefully the batteries will, you know, keep us going all day. Uh, my bad, but it turned out being really good. It was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Um, yeah. Caught some fish. That that is so cool. And, and then guys, again, link in the episode description, everything we talk about today, including both their, uh, so everything, their social media handles. Um, I do have one question for Matt before we, before we put a bow on things. So I don't want to keep you guys too long. Um, Matt, what's your favorite style of finesse, Matt? Love a shaky head, but getting into the deep, to the drop shot, I can read drop shot this year and it's producing. Man, I, I think a drop shot is probably my number one finesse bait after last year, just really getting it dialed in with the scope and really focusing a lot on throwing it. I would take the drop shot over a shaky head, to be honest, even though coincidentally, I had this conversation with John Cruz that day and he was like, I throw a a shaky head way more than a drop shot because I think fish are just way more uh, like they want to eat it off the bottom more times than not because they're not looking up at it and seeing it it's like below them so they'll they'll know something's there and like they might follow it and eat it more out of because they can't see it fully so that kind of changed my mind on it and i'm gonna definitely experience uh, experiment more with it this summer i think the shaky head is replacing the jig in a lot of ways I really do. I think when I, I've had so many Carolina anglers talk about skipping a jig. So it's like, okay, so if the whole state of North Carolina and South Carolina are skipping a jig, those bass are probably getting conditioned to that. And I was talking to Billy Coles of Smith Mountain Lake Guide Services about this, about how it seemed like the jig bite is not what it used to be, but you pick up a shaky head, those same places they work. And I, Matt, I'm so glad you said this about distance. There's something about the drop shot that people think the leader has to be 10 feet long. And Aaron Martin has talked about, he had a tiny ass leader on that thing. (laughs) I literally know exactly what you're talking about. And so many people that I've fished with have been like, wow, you fish a really short drop shot. I'm Mm -hmm. like, especially in the winter, I'm like, yeah, Aaron Martin's did this video. He's like, in the winter, he makes it really short. Like sometimes just as short as the worm or even shorter. And as it gets warmer, you can make it longer. But that has somehow led to me doing like a 10 to 12 inch max drop shot leader. Dude, I'm God, that, that, that video is a blast from the past. You're bringing back some memories about that. I mean, he's the yeah. only one that made me think pink worms are actually sexy and will work. It's because mm-hmm. of that stupid magic. Uh, goodness gracious. Guys, yeah, again, I, I don't want to keep you too long tonight. Thank you so much for coming on. I, I would love to get you guys on at some point to do a post tournament with you guys on your next BFL, just how it went, what you guys think you did well, what you want to improve on, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Hopefully we catch a bass or two. I'm just going to have that first place trophy right here on the next podcast for sure. Okay. okay but I'll take second. <laughs> <Next> second. 
Give Dude, me some predictions. That, that, is, the, <laughs> that is the thing about us is, is Matt is one of my best friends. We talk just about every day. There is no one in the world I want to beat more than this guy. <laughs> and I know he feels the exact same way. I could, I'll take second place. Only if you win though. Yeah. That only if I win, if he wins, um, there's no one that's going to be happier, <laughs> but if he doesn't win, I want to beat him bad. <laughs> oh my goodness. I know that feeling. Um, predictions guys, give me some predictions on the bass opens. And then of course your BFL coming up here in two weeks. I want to hear what you say. Cause I know I've, I've talked to a lot of the pros and they've asked me and I have what I think. So I'm, I'm curious what you're going to say. Three days, three days. Yeah. I'm going to say 45 pounds to win, to win. Okay. I was higher. I'm at, um, I think 52, 53 is where I'm at. I think around 16 to 18 a day is going to win. I think that lake has so many two and three pounders. Not that they're going to be easy to catch, but I think you're going to see so many people. Like you might see 200 boats in that 12 to 15 range. Like there's going to be so many bags in that range that I think four, five, six pounders are so hard to come by that someone's going to figure that out and, and catch, you know, 16 to 18 a day. Yeah. And, and David Williams, yes, they're both fishing as boaters. Um, I think it's probably going to be about 40, I think 42, maybe 45. I just, that lake is so weird. There's a ton of boats and I don't think there's a lot of five and six pound fish in there. It, it, it's, I just, I just don't. And again, do I fish a lot? No, but I've gone through the archives of like the BFLs that are on that lake and it's just not, I don't know could be wrong because the water is in the bushes. I think if it wasn't in the bushes, I don't think the weights would be very high at all. I think it'd be a lot harder to fish that place. Now your BFL, what do you think? To win? I'm at BFL. You get a lot, like you'll have a lot of locals in the open, but BFL you'll have 70% locals. Probably. I'm going to say, I'm going to say for a one day shootout, I'm going to say 16 and a half to 17, somewhere in that range to win. Wow. I was thinking 18. 18. Yeah. 18. Yeah. Yeah. For, I mean, for anything, a one day shootout, like any, like one someone can different. stumble. Yeah. And I think, I think first day of the Bassmaster Open, we will see someone will have 20. I think someone will have 20 and then you'll see the weights drop, you know, day two, day three. But, there, there will be one or two 20 pound bag wet bags weighed in my opinion do you think anyone cracks 22 23 pounds i don't think that much i think 20 is definitely possible i want to say i fished um an english choice event there a few weeks ago and i think the first day was 20 pounds what won it it was like 20 and a half so it's definitely that 20 You'll see a 20 pound bag i wouldn't no say doubt, 20 is over i wouldn't say over 21 yeah i i wouldn't say 20 is like a unicorn bag by any means like 20 pounds happens out there like it's it's nothing that's like crazy but you don't really see 22 23 24 out there so i think that someone will crack a big bag and then i could i could see a couple 20s coming in throughout the tournament I, I'm I'm interested to see. I mean, I think. I mean, this is the last question. I'm sorry, I keep this just popped in there. What lake would you want to see a big tournament like this on? Because to me, it's like no one talks about Smith. Maybe that's good. It doesn't get the pressure, but I think Smith would just smoke this place when it comes to bags brought in. I mean, there was I think two seven pounders brought in at the last BFL. Like it's insane how that lake produces. But like, where would you guys want to see something like this? Hunter, you can't say the James. <laughs> it's already done that. I do last not year. want to see a tournament on the James. <laughs> not Stay another, away, not again. <laughs> so no, I think Smith Mountain Lake would be pretty sick. That'd be really it, cool. it would be awesome to see that, um, like tiered angler, the yeah. 225 of those guys out there really just breaking it down. I think it'd be pretty sick. You'd see some really big bags. I a think lot of big fish without going into like logistics and stuff because I know there's so much that goes with putting these turn these 250 boat tournaments on. I think Smith Mountain, you put them on Smith Mountain in April, it's the weights like you saw, saw in the BFL, the weights would be insane. I think there'd be they you could see like Toledo Bend type numbers come out of Smith Mountain Lake. Like you could see a 28 pound bag come out of there. 
and and stuff like that. And I think with again without looking at logistics, I'd like to see him go to like I don't think they would fit, but like Anna would be really cool. Because Anna, I mean, you know, oh, that would be sporty. <laughs> if you put, I mean, I don't know how if it would handle 250 boats, but you get one dock each. <laughs> if you, like if you, in rotation. Yes. If you suppose, I mean, they were putting. I mean, McCluskey was catching 30 pounds. That McCluskey catches 30 pounds uh, every weekend. You're right, but like they're catching 30 pounds out there. Like that's, I mean, it was the winter time and stuff, but there's not many places that's happened. So I'd like to see, you know, a big tournament trail like i mean the elites could go there they only have 80 90 100 boats so that would be cool, like I, would be really cool. I would like duck it to get it together and get the mlf guys because they break their fields down i think yep. chat help me out it's either 30 or 40 boat i don't know what it is per day yeah. roanoke rapids and lake gaston and rotate them they did it for all those uh lakes around um Char uh, charlottesville north carolina they should do that for those two places because Roanoke, La that's another place I need to do a hidden, uh, just a nice little breakdown of because that's a neat lake that no one fishes and it's I've there. It. So, John, I don't know if you've heard, um, we've got a trail around here called John But Elite and it's horsepower restricted. They go, um, I think, to all nine, nine places. They have some on the river. I think they go to Gaston. They went to Roanoke Rapids, I think, for their first event last year. And it was some of the craziest weights I've ever seen. I know my buddy Travis Crowell. He's um, down in Texas now. I think he had two pounds on day one and came back with like 20 something on day two and won the tournament. Like it, like they were, the weights for the single days were just insane. That's so crazy. Again, it's like there are so many lakes in Virginia. And I, I again, I could do a whole episode on that about the electric boat culture, which I want to do because I was talking to Jeff Little at ICAST last year. And apparently, this is allegedly what he said, that the two hot spots for electric motors is Georgia and Virginia because they have yep. so many electric motor only lakes. For sure. And it's insane because no one talks about that, but that's the next big thing. Kayak fishing is cool and all, but you can't do that with a buddy unless you're going to get real intimate on a, on a Hobie 14 yeah. electric motor is where it's at. Yep. It is. No, those I've actually fished a couple of the RLOS events like rip and lips open series. They're electric only highly recommended to anybody watching. Like they put on such a good tournament. There was like 70, 70 boats. And the two that I fished, they pull huge fields, like over 50 boats. It's not as like, I the way I pictured it, like, you know, it's electric only. Everyone blasts off. It's like <laughs> you're riding next to each other, except for the guys that have the real high powered, fast electric motors. But I had this strange feeling. It was like you're fishing literally shoulder to shoulder with everybody all day. And we fished. The first one I fished was on Diaskin. And I feel like I, I didn't see a boat all day. When there were 70 people, it was sick. Or 70 boats, rather. So like 140 people fishing. Nuts. And, and so honest, and you can scratch the itch, and it's highly, highly competitive. And, and with boats getting as expensive as they are and all that, I, I just don't – there's got to be a breaking point. Like, you can't. And I and I get it, guys. And we'll, this is a whole other conversation. But it was $100,000 to get into this thing. I think electric but electric motor only tournaments and kayak series, that's where it's at. That's where all the money's going. Just look at the industry. And so I think it's interesting to see where this actually goes. I think Jay Kumar, he has this bass blaster email thing. S some company just made like a fifty thousand dollar electric motor only bass boat and he took a picture of it. I I'll put it in the in the thread at some point, but it's just insane. But but the point is like companies are now looking at this and understanding the fact that this yep. is a thing that's going on. Yep. And then you have boat builders like Matt Downs from trick tens who's making, I mean, you can, you can drop 10 grand and you have the baddest electric John boat out. And like, we have to spend, you know, 50, 60, 70, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars to, to compete with the best. So it's so much more affordable. I mean, 10 grand sounds like a lot for a John boat, but when you're fishing for a, a couple grand every weekend, you know, same money that we're fishing for, you know, you want to have the best. So it's, it, you can spend way less and have the best than, you know, the glass rigs. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And again, guys, link in the episode description, everything we talked about there. Um, Matt, Hunter, please get, take a second here and just uh, promote your sponsors, anything else, any websites, anything that you've have coming up. HPS fishing, HPS fishing, so, HPS fishing on Instagram and YouTube. Go yep. Check them out. 
Yep. Grinding the YouTubes. Um, you know, sponsor wise, Fish and Protect's been with me since the beginning. Um, picked up, you know, with Oliver Nye last year, Big Bass Dreams, and teamed up with Barry from Intuition Fishing. And he's got some awesome tungsten stuff. But yeah, grinding the YouTubes, grinding the the Instagrams, um, HPS Fishing and that's me. He sponsored follow. Sponsor. <laughs> you, you, got couple, you got a couple That's sponsors. Uh, I do. I do. And I wouldn't be able to do anything without him, actually. So huge shout out and thank you to both English Choice and Trick Tins. Matt Downs built the amazing King Neptune and he's building crazy boats every month. It seems like now he's popping them out so quick. He just did one for Fisher Yin and it's like a 1436 pretty small john boat but it's insane it looks amazing it's i mean insane. phenomenal it's so cool um yeah between those two those are my uh what do we call them the golden sponsors well i think the way that me and matt are about spawn is like i won't promote anyone that i don't feel like is the best in that category for me like fish and protect big best dreams intuition they all fit me perfectly i am i know the owners i can pick up the phone at any point and they'll answer so I'm not going to take a BS sponsorship. Neither is Matt. So these are the companies that like we physically cannot do it without them. Like we can't travel to these opens. We can't, we're not getting all this tackle, you know, without them. So it's anyone that, you know, I, we're working with, they're hundred percent legit and we back them up hundred percent. And that's so important to have that trust to be able to, because again, guys, what you don't understand about content creation, um, you got to have, there's not a lot of money in it and you're putting a lot of work into basically art. It's your art. It's your passion to do this. And this is your ability to take your creative abilities and match that with fishing. So whether you want to be a content creator and talk about Marvel movies, or you want to do fishing or podcasting, whatever you're taking that like artistic gene that you have and you're blending that with your passion and getting sponsors that understand that there's art, this is actually art that you're doing and they're not going to meddle too much. It gives you the creative freedom to be able to keep producing awesome stuff. So dude, great stuff as always guys. Thank you so much. Um, please like and subscribe to them again link in the episode description to everything that we just talked about today please like and subscribe to this channel we are the number one uh fishing radio show in the greater d metropolitan area we might be talking a little bit more but this live stream is over see you guys later bye you're listening to fishing the dmv with your hosts thomas aarons and jared mounts fishing the dmv is brought to you by jake's bait and tackle located in winchester virginia if that doesn't get you jacked up i don't know what will